Welcome and thank you for joining CIFARTH's webinar, European Reductions in Force, 10 Things to Look Out For. All participants are in listen-only mode. You are encouraged to submit questions throughout the program through the Q&A section located on the right side of your WebEx window. We will do our best to get to everyone's questions. Any unanswered questions will be followed up by email after the webinar. For those interested in CLE credit, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation. Please write this code down. It will not be repeated and it is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and presentation materials will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Caitlin Lane. Caitlin, you may begin. Thanks, Sophia. We can get to the next slide. Great. Oh, back to the agenda. We need to go back two slides. Great, perfect. Um, Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Caitlin Lane and I'm joined by my colleagues and partners um, from left to right on the screen is Sophia Bargolini, Paul Winder, and Harvey Lawrence, or Lawrence Harvey Wood. Um, today we're here to discuss 10 areas to look out for when considering a reduction in force specifically in Europe. Um, and those 10 topics are, are on the agenda here. And while many of these topics are applicable outside of Europe as well, this webinar in particular takes a closer look at Europe's specific implications and considerations. Next slide, please. So our first topic is planning and strategy timing. And we start with this because advanced planning and strategy development are critical to meeting business objectives and minimizing risk for any company that's looking at a global um, reduction in force. Um, at the outset, company objectives should be clearly defined so that the strategy for execution can be built around those goals. Um, for example, where a company is primarily concerned with reducing headcount quickly, or meeting certain time milestones, that strategy can differ from a situation where the primary objective is achieving longer term cost savings, where perhaps there's a little less um, risk tolerance and time is not as critical of a goal. So where time is scarce, there may be countries where a more informal process can be utilized to speed up the timeline. Uh, for instance, by reaching mutual agreements to exit employees, as opposed to proceeding through a more formal process. In other countries, and depending on whether there are employee representative bodies, it may not be possible to, or, or it may be very risky to circumvent a formal process. And in that case, it'll be really important that the business knows timing implications up front because that'll help manage expectations internally. Um, so when we look at these projects, really understanding what is what is the prep time, what are the execution timings, um, and how does that impact the strategy that, that ultimately the business wants to take. Um, we find that this tends to be particularly important with U.S. companies that have employees globally and um, perhaps in some cases may not be familiar with the nuanced processes across Europe that takes significantly more time than perhaps a business is used to in the US. Um, strategy planning from the outset is also really important for purposes of planning a more, um, on a more global level. So identifying factors such as priority countries, um, you may have, for instance, countries where there's significant headcount um, and then other countries that just have a few employees um, and deciding whether the company wants to take a global approach or a staged approach or a regional approach, that's really important too, um, because it becomes important not just to the execution and the implementation, but also communication and messaging, managing um, employee relations and employee engagement as well. So these are all really kind of critical things to think about when we, we look at this planning stage. Um, there's also gonna be key planning data that will need to be collected and, and prepared at the outset to guide the strategy um, and, and planning process. It's not enough to simply say, particularly in Europe, we have five people in, in Germany and we want to um, make headcount reductions. We really need to know more than, than just what is it that we want to do? 
Um, we want to know how many roles do we think are going to be impacted and what's the total headcount. That can be critical because it can impact the actual process that may need to be followed. Um, same thing with any recent terminations. So oftentimes when we look at the process that has to be followed, that can be impacted by whether it's um, an individual or mass or collective process and head count and recent terminations all go to that analysis. So um, taking that into consideration as well. Same thing with existence of employee rep bodies. So is the company required to go any, undergo any sort of consultation obligations? Um, and, and again, uh, employee relations sensitivities, this oftentimes goes to um, communication and, and also understanding what's, what's the environment currently um, in the entity? Um, have there been recent actions that um, you know, may impact how employees view this, this next round, if it's, there's multiple rounds, how are employees going to stay engaged if this is done in a staged approach? Um, and so I think the takeaway from this lookout point is, is really about understanding that time spent in the planning and strategy phase up front um, is really critical to a, a more seamless execution stage later on. Um, so even where time is of the essence, spending that time to properly think about the analysis and the strategy will kind of pay dividends in, on the back end um, and make make the time actually um, uh, more in, in the company's favor when it comes to implementation. Um, next slide, please. So the next lookout point is the rationale for the restructure. Um, and when we say rationale, we're talking about what's your business case? What's the reason for having this restructure? Um, and having kind of strict parameters around the rationale are more frequently required in European countries than other regions globally. Um, so this means that in, in certain countries, it may not be enough to simply say, we want to restructure for efficiency reasons, or we want to restructure um, for, for, you know, whatever business reason may be underlying. Um, in, in many cases, it actually has to be more specific than that. And to further complicate things, there's not a one size fits all approach um, because the legal requirements actually vary by countries. So for example, um, in France, for instance, it may be necessary to have a financial ra rationale that actually shows actual losses, um, not enough to say we wanna prevent the losses. In contrast, in Germany, for example, it, it may be sufficient, depending on the circumstances, to have a management decision decide that the restructure is needed for business efficiency reasons, but you don't necessarily have to show that financial component. Um, and so these are just kind of nuanced examples to demonstrate that the, the underpinning uh, reasons for the action that a, a business desires to take will vary across European jurisdictions. And with that comes the fact that the level and detail of evidence required, uh, particularly if there is a works council, will need to, to be considered. Um, this, this kind of is looked at on a country by country basis, but from a global perspective, there's often the question of harmonizing the rationale. Can we use a, a rationale that spans across various countries? And in some cases it may not be possible to do that precisely because the law will require certain criteria be met to be able to take um, undertake certain processes. Um, and so for US based multinationals carrying out reductions in force in Europe, this is a really important step, but it's one that can sometimes be overlooked. Um, but it's really quite critical because much of the reduction exercise when it comes to actually implementing um, the, the process that will need to be followed oftentimes falls back on this rationale. Uh, and so it's really critical to make sure that this step is being considered when looking at the total picture. And I think the other piece that's really important too is that the strength or the weakness of the rationale can have a significant impact on time and costs um, and, and how you actually go about strategically executing. You know, if you're in a situation where you have a really weak rationale, there's probably more of a need to reach agreements with employees to offer a more significant um, financial package 
to avoid potential claims because you know that your rationale is not strong and, and it may not withstand scrutiny should an employee bring a claim um, in a, a court or a tribunal system. And so um, that's, that's really important to keep in mind as well. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Lawrence. Thanks, Caitlin. And uh, to start with, I'm going to talk about uh, selection, how you go about selecting individual employees for potential dismissal. Um, once you've uh, worked out your rationale, as, as, as we've just covered. So starting point in Europe, when you carry out a reduction in force is generally you will have to choose which employees to dismiss by applying so-called social selection criteria. And in practice, in reality, probably you will be starting with a list of names of individuals in scope employees who've been identified by the business in the relevant departments. But even though that's in practice your starting point, most commonly, uh, you kind of have to work backwards from there. Perhaps that's a cynical way of seeing it, but work backwards from there, working out how best to justify selecting those individuals based on the local law constraints in the relevant countries, uh, if indeed you can. Um, the applicable required selection criteria, they may be specified under local statute. Um, you may instead have to look at the applicable um, national or regional collective bargaining agreement to see which criteria you have to take into account. But a common theme here, not universal, but common is um, in many countries, there'll be little or even no scope for taking employees professional value, that's to say that their performance track record into account. Um, instead, usually you have to apply criteria based on employees' personal circumstances. So if we just look at a couple of examples um, to illustrate that, um, in France, there are four statutory criteria. You have to take all four into account, uh, and they are length of service, family circumstances, meaning how many dependents at home is the uh, employee supporting, um, social characteristics, making it harder in principle for that employee to find a new job. So commonly you take into account um, age, especially over 50, you might take into account disability, that kind of thing. And finally, professional skills. So in France, it's a mixture of personal, personal social um, characteristics and professional skills. Um, by contrast, another example, if we take the Netherlands, I believe in the Netherlands, the required approach is that you divide employees into 10-year um, age brackets, and then within each bracket, um, you have to, generally speaking, apply the so-called LIFO, that's last in, first out, um, seniority test. Um, obviously, where we're talking about selection, um, that implies that you're looking at uh, a given job family, so a pool, uh, a selection pool of interchangeable employees, it's not normally required that you be selecting between people in identical roles, but there's normally a requirement that what they do, what um, skills and qualifications the employees have are sufficiently close that it makes sense to treat them as a single group for purposes of fair and equitable um, selection. Um, it all sounds pretty bad so far, but um, there may be some flexibility for, for you to decide how you're going to apply the criteria in each country. And so, for example, in France, we saw there are four criteria. You have to take them into account. Uh, you would normally do it by having a, a point system for each of the four criteria. But within reason, you can choose how many points to allocate to each criterion, provided you don't do that in such uh, an extreme way that, in effect, you're excluding or making irrelevant one or more of those criteria. I think a last consideration, a practical point about selection is, if you're doing a RIF a reduction in force after a corporate acquisition, um, you may want to think about um, if you need to carry out 
um, a collective dismissal um, in order to reduce the number of employees within the integrated um, workforce um, because you've bought a business in various European countries where you have an existing workforce carrying out the same kind of business. Probably worth thinking about, do you want to have to apply selection criteria across the combined population after local integration? Or do you want to, uh, so to speak, protect uh, your legacy population and carry out a RIF in the local European subsidiaries of the acquired business before you merge? Um, the point being that usually you have to apply selection criteria within a given legal employing entity. Um, a word now about um, redeployment requirements. So once you've applied your selection criteria in most European countries before you go ahead and dismiss, uh, there'll be some kind of obligation to try to find suitable vacancies within the group uh, in order to avoid dismissal. Um, and what are the consequences if you fail to do that? Typically, uh, the employee may be ruled unfair if the employee goes to court after being dismissed. Typically, that would lead to an award of damages rather than reinstatement, but it depends on the country. Um, so, for example, in some countries, it may even mean that you can't dismiss the individual because there's a local requirement to obtain authorization from the labor authorities. And if the labor authorities identify that you failed to offer a suitable vacancy, they're not going to give you that authorization. So <clears throat> how in practice can you plan ahead to make sure you comply with your redeployment obligations? First, most important, um, I think, check what the local requirements are in each country, um, because in many countries, you only have to look for vacancies in the same country, but there are some um, countries such as the, the Netherlands, where in principle, you have to look throughout the group worldwide for any suitable vacancies. Once you've done that, and if you do find any suitable vacancies, um, at that point in practice, you're going to have to decide, well, shall we offer this position to one or more of our at-risk people, or shall we instead uh, decide it's not a suitable um, vacancy for whatever reason, language or otherwise. At that point, you need to document internally why you're making that decision, because it, it may be six months, 12 months later, that you're in court having to explain why you didn't offer that position. Um, at that point, people may have forgotten the decision process, people may have left the company and so on. So good to keep records on that. If we move on now to the next slide, please. Um, a few words <coughs> about protected employees. What do I mean by that? Um, protection from dismissal, whether it's on a RIF or performance related, Protection in Europe applies, it's triggered by various characteristics depending on the country, but a common one would be pregnancy or maternity leave, also parental leave, also I think in Germany being on, as a, a, on carer leave would give you protection from dismissal, um, disability, absence due to a work-related injury, uh, these confer protection in some countries, uh, even being on ordinary sickly rather than work-related illness will give you protection, I think, in Belgium and the Netherlands. And uh, being an employee representative carries its own form of protection, typically. Um, another kind of collective protection which applies for women in Italy, uh, this is one I only encountered recently, is that um, when you apply a collective, uh, implement a collective dismissal in Italy, you're not allowed to dismiss a higher percentage of women than that of your existing workforce. So if you currently have a, a workforce 45% women and you want to dismiss 10 people in your RIF, then uh, you can't dismiss more than four women when you implement that procedure. Um, in practice, as part of the planning process, you need to look at how in each country this protection actually operates. 
Is it absolute, unviolable protection as long as that characteristic applies to the individual? Or does the protection just mean you can do it, but you have to tick certain boxes first? And so, I mean, an example of how that would play out. In France, you can dismiss uh, employee representatives, but first you have to consult your works council expressly about it, and then you need positive authorization from the local labor inspector before you can do it. Uh, and that's different from the situation in Germany, I believe, where you would simply exclude works council members from the selection process. So that means you can select someone else. You can select the colleague of the works council member instead, whereas you couldn't do that in France if you were unable to get the authorization. Let's move on now to my last slide, please. Discovery risks. Um, why am I talking about discovery risks in relation to reductions in force? Um, I thought it was worth mentioning that in Europe, before you take the decision to launch a collective dismissal, it's a good idea to think about whether you're going to expose yourself to a risk of having to divulge confidential company information in the course of that process. Now, in, in the US, you may be familiar with discovery processes whereby a litigious employee or union can obtain disclosure of relevant documents um, from the employer. Uh, on the other hand, if you're dragged into litigation in Europe, in a civil law jurisdiction like Italy or France, uh, generally there are no overriding disclosure obligations. So when you go into litigation, each party just discloses the evidence which supports their own case and any um, un unfortunate, regrettable evidence that they have, uh, <laughs> they don't have to produce it. But do keep in mind that when you implement a reduction in force, there are different ways in which employees or their representatives may be able to force you to disclose information which you'd really rather keep to yourself. Um, and the first one I have in mind is that in the course of a consultation of a works council on a collective dismissal, in some countries, the works council has a right to appoint an expert, uh, typically an accountant, to advise it at the company's expense um, during the consultation procedure, and in particular, to look at the economic rationale um, in great detail. Um, in France, for example, the expert in that situation has the same right of access to company information as a statutory auditor would do under French law. And that means in practice, the expert can ask for pretty much any information about the company's operations and financials without having to justify why it's relevant. And that can even include parent company information, which uh, you know, I've often seen with US clients, starts to look pretty, pretty worrying in terms of what will we have to hand over mm -hmm. to this guy who is there to um, give the works council um, uh, ammunition with which to, to fight this uh, collective dismissal process. And you may try to manage that procedure with the works council expert in various ways. Typically, you ask the expert to sign an NDA uh, and other techniques may, may be relevant. Um, a final point to mention on this, um, another way that at individual level, um, employees may be able to compel disclosure of confidential information is by exploiting European data privacy legislation, the uh, GDPR, that um, <clears throat> can be used to ask for disclosure of all personal data relating to the individual in question. So that might be used, for example, to try to force the company to disclose internal emails, revealing why in reality they were selected for dismissal. I will hand over now to my colleague, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, so now, yeah, we go on with worst councils, trade unions, process and notification, the first thing to look out for when speaking about unions. So uh, 
as you know, many EU countries provide for trade union or works council consultation process to validly implement the reef. Uh, this means that every time you start thinking about a reef in Europe, you should understand which is the timing for this consultation process. This uh, Trade unions works council consultation processes are differently are differently ruled in different EU countries, which means, for example, that in my country in Italy, the process, the consultation process with unions may last up to 75 days, while, for example, in France, uh, it it may be different. It may last one month up to four months, depending on employees involved. Uh, so the employer must be aware of the timing of these processes. So calling the lawyer and saying we need to dismiss a bunch of people in one month may not be feasible in Europe, or at least not in all the countries. Uh, the notification, the consultation process is normally started with uh, an information to be given to the unions or to the worst council. Uh, which are the details to be shared. There are countries like France where you have to prepare, the company has to prepare a very detailed information paper for the unions. Uh, there are other countries in which the company is simply required to explain which is the process. And this is a formal communication to start the time frame to start, you know, the, the deadline uh, to expire at a certain point. Uh, another, another important point when speaking about consultation processes, who are we going to involve in this consultation process? Do we need to speak to our host council? Are we obliged to call also local, territorial, national trade unions? For example, in Italy, it depends on the size of the company, on how many regions in Italy are involved in this process. So it may depend. Uh, in some cases, when uh, uh, many regions are involved, you may need to go also to speak to the Ministry of Labor, centrally in Rome. So uh, everything is, every detail of the procedure is really important because Without a valid procedure in many EU countries, all the dismissals issued at the end of this procedure will be null and void if all the formal steps weren't properly uh, followed. Uh, another point that you should think about is, can I be assisted by my lawyers or by, I don't know, an employer association or other consultants during the consultation process? Sometimes, yes, it's possible, so you may ask for help. Uh, normally, the entire consultation process is aimed at finding an agreement. Uh, I can say, in most cases, it's really, really important. So when we start the consultation process, we try to reach an agreement because we want to avoid future litigations. So when we think about an agreement that we want to reach, what should it cover? Uh, it may cover selection criteria. So for example, in my country in Italy, is it possible to agree with unions the criteria to be followed to dismiss employees? Uh, we can agree the timing for the dismissals to be implemented. We may need to immediately dismiss employees at the end of the consultation process, or we may need to end over uh, or to finalize uh, a project and maybe uh, agree, with the, agree with the unions um, uh, dismissal in waves, for example. Uh, we, we may need to deal with notice periods, so we may decide if we uh, to work during the notice period or to be paid the indemnity in lieu of. We, of course, this, the key part of the agreements with unions at the end of the consultation process is the severance package. So 
how much money are we putting on the table for the employees to not file a claim against the business. So it's really, really important to think about um, before starting the consultation process, all these key issues, because they will be as the essential part of the consultation phase with unions. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, I like really much this uh, topic. Uh, so still speaking about uh, worst council at trade unions, here we are uh, speaking about um, the goodwill, the good relationships with uh, with unions, so good industrial uh, relations. Um, as said, the employers in the EU are um, generally speaking strongly unionized or M or F Works Council. So what we need to think about before starting a RIF in, uh, in Europe. Um, so, well, generally speaking, uh, if the company is not unionized yet, uh, the decision to implement a RIF, a mass dismissal process, may be a good opportunity for unions to get support within the company's workforce. So it's strongly important that we know in advance that this is a risk. Differently, on the other side, uh, long-lasting long good relationships between the company's management and the unions or the Works Council are really, really important. And it's crucial that we try to keep those good relationships also after the RIF is implemented. So we should take into account to allow the local management to do whatever is necessary to maintain good relationships with the unions because missed or bad informal communication to unions or worse council, other obviously other than the formal process which is mandatory, may lead to strikes, to strikes of overtime, tough unionization, uh, unions may claims uh, may file a claim for union rights or for discrimination. Uh, and the, the saddest part of this is that when you, when you build a trusted relationship with them and at a certain point uh, you lose this relationship, then you will lose their support when you need to implement new policies, when you need to adjust working time, introducing night shifts, for example, in Italy, uh, when introducing night shifts, you need union support, union authorization. So uh, it's crucial and it's vital to try to maintain all those good relationships also after uh, the RIF is implemented. Thank you. So we go to the um, eighth thing to look out for when uh, speaking about RIF in Europe. Uh, EU routes may lead to high severance costs and benefits um, for the employees affected by a dismissal. So just to think about the fact when implementing a RIF in Europe, uh, this may be cost effective. Um, certainly, uh, certainly, we should take into account the payment in view of notice period. So, employees that are dismissed sometimes may work the notice period. In some other cases, they will be paid uh, the indemnity in view of notice. Uh, that may depend on the employee grade and length of service. Just to let you know, in Italy, notice period may last up, in the worst case scenario, up to 12 months. So it's um, a, a cost that should be taken into consideration before uh, implementing the RIF. Uh, severance payment uh, may be provided by the law or by the CDA or may be negotiated by the employee's representatives during the consultation phase that we described before. Uh, 
severance packages may be fixed amount, the same for all the employees, or maybe a variable amount depending on the employee's month salary. So for example, during the negotiation phase, you may decide to agree with the unions, um, I don't know, 10, 12, 18 month salary per each employee, and then the economics will depend on each employee month salary. Uh, often, in many countries, uh, the value of the fringe benefits must be taken into, um, into consideration to the final calculations. Um, another point, during the consultation and negotiation phase with the unions, the employee's representative may ask uh, the company to provide for additional benefits to dismiss employees to avoid litigations which means, for example, uh, outplacement, it's often provided in Europe, outplacement paid by the company, uh, extended uh, health insurance uh, uh, cover, uh, relocation uh, in France to have redeployment leave. So all uh, details that must be taken into account when thinking about a brief in Europe, because uh, it's certainly, uh, it's certainly, um, it, it may certainly cost a lot depending on uh, the country and the number of employees in practice. Now I hand over to Paul. Thank you very much, Sophia. Um, so I'm going to be in, in talking about first timing challenges. So whilst many of the points that have been raised so far will obviously impact on timing, there are some particular aspects of European RIFs which will um, potentially greatly impact how quickly employees can be got off um, the payroll. So some examples uh, of that would be um, employees acquiring protected status if they go off on sick leave prior to formal notification having been given. That would apply in countries like Belgium and the Netherlands and it could be particularly problematical let's say in the Netherlands, where employees are entitled to up to two years worth of paid sick leave. So uh, to counter that, it's usually advisable to not give uh, advanced warning uh, of the purpose of the meeting at which the employee is going to be uh, informed that they are either redundant or at risk of being made redundant. Um, now, whilst Europe doesn't really recognise the concept of at-will employment, uh, and therefore uh, in all jurisdictions, barring exceptional circumstances, notice will have to be provided. In some jurisdictions, um, as Sophia mentioned earlier, for example, in Italy, UK, uh, you can pay in lieu of notice, particularly if you reserve the right to do that. In many other European jurisdictions, pay in lieu of notice or pylon is not uh, really a recognised concept or it's not really culturally uh, an accepted practice unless the employees <laughs> can be um, persuaded to enter into an NTA or a mutual termination agreement. And we've just listed out some of the countries there, so Czech, Finland, France, Germany, Poland, uh, and so on. Obviously, if you're <coughs> going to want the employees to enter into an MTA so that they can be exited uh, in accordance with the business's timeline. An additional sum is going to have to be paid to persuade them to enter into that agreement. Now, even where a pylon might be possible under an MTA, there are certain countries where the employee will still be reluctant uh, to uh, agree to that, um, particularly if they have not lined up alternative employment. And a good example uh, is Germany. And, and the reason is that uh, if the employees agree to leave under an MTA, then they will lose their state unemployment benefits. So that can be a, a strong reason for them not to, not to do that. Um, there can be a quirk uh, in certain countries as to when notice will actually expire. Some good examples of that are Czech, Denmark, Netherlands, Switzerland, and there are others. And what I mean by that is, let's say you gave, let's say you had to give an employee two months notice of termination, and you gave uh, <clears> that <throat> notice in the first week of March. Notice would not actually expire until the end of May. 
reason being that it can only uh, expire at the end of a particular month. An exception to that would be Germany, which permits uh, notice of termination to expire on the 15th of the month. So in that example, termination would take effect on May 15th. The UK has its own idiosyncratic rule in respect of um, pylons. If there is not a contractual entitlement to make a pylon, then technically that would be a breach of contract. And whilst the employee wouldn't sue because you would have paid money that they were owed, so they won't actually suffer any loss, what it does mean is that you cannot, as the employer, rely on any post-termination restrictions in the agreement because you are in breach. So as the party in breach, you cannot then enforce any terms of the contract. Um, before moving on to the next slide, um, for those of you who need a CLE code, the code is SS3266. That's SS3266. So, last slide, number 10, uh, documentation, document execution and delivery. So, unfortunately, uh, finalising documents, getting them ready and delivering them to the employees can be administratively burdensome in a lot of countries uh, in Europe. And again, that can present timing challenges. So, we'll give some illustrations uh, of how this can occur. Um, many uh, European countries have the somewhat quaint practice of still requiring a wet signature. So someone to actually sign the document and that original signed version of the document to be handed to the employee. This can obviously create uh, logistical challenges, for example, in Czech, Germany and Switzerland. Even if um, a country permits um, an electronic signature, uh, it may be the case that the particular jurisdiction will not accept, for example, a PDF version of the signed document. It would have to be uh, something like a qualified electronic signature, which is a kind of higher uh, level of signature where there is proof of the identity of the signatory uh, the, the document, the, the signed document cannot be tampered with after being signed uh, and so on. Um, there are also oftentimes a requirement for documents to be signed by authorised signatories and that actually frequently causes um, issues, um, particularly when terminations are planned uh, around um, traditional vacation periods, for example, uh, in the summer or um, in the lead up to uh, the um, Christmas break. And it's often been the case that we've found that um, clients haven't anticipated this, haven't spoken to us about uh, what their requirements are and find at the very end that the uh, signatory is on holiday or is on a business trip. And it can be, it can be quite restrictive um, as to who can sign. So for example, in Switzerland, uh, it has to be the individual that's named on the commercial uh, registry. Now, it is possible to work around that issue uh, if, um, it, with appropriate planning, by putting in place um, a temporary power of attorney uh, to appoint someone else who can sign uh, on behalf of the uh, employer. Um, and finally, um, whilst um, meetings conducted remotely have become a lot more common, particularly um, uh, post pandemic or during the pandemic and post pandemic, there's still uh, in, uh, in certain countries a reluctance um, or a practical difficulty uh, in doing this. And a good example would be Czech Republic. And the reason would be that the practice there is, particularly if you're going to have the employee enter into a mutual termination agreement, is to have them sign the uh, documents at the meeting or shortly after the meeting. That's a wet signature country, so the preference is that the meeting will be conducted um, face to face. And uh, planning will also need to be taken into account for delivery of the documents, even if the meeting is um, held remotely. So, for example, in Germany, in Germany, it's strongly advisable to get the documents couriered over to the employees 
immediately following the meeting. Spain actually has its own quirk, which is that uh, in order for the termination to be effective, the termination payments have to be made on the same day as the notification of termination uh, is given. Um, so that brings us to um, the end of the 10 things to look out for when making a reduction in force in Europe. We're doing pretty well for time, so I think we've got some questions that have come in. Um, I'm going to look on my side here. Caitlin, if you want to have a look on your side there as well, see if you can pick out anything um, that uh, would be good for us to, to respond to. That'd be great. Um, I've got one here, which I think actually, Lawrence, goes to your um, question about alternative employment. So how do you document the fact that you have complied with um, these redeployment obligations? OK. Um... Yeah, so, okay, so in, in countries where you need to um, show that you carried out a proper search for suitable vacancies and acted accordingly, I mean, um, practical steps that I've seen undertaken um, at the time of implementation in order to be as well prepared a later challenge as possible. Um, it kind of depends upon um, what the um, internal resources are, but quite commonly there may be a worldwide intranet um, job search forum. So an employee in France who's afraid of being made redundant in a few weeks' time, they might start looking up um, on the internet, uh, vacancies in such and such an area, um, and maybe taking a screen print regularly so that they can potentially later show, you know, that on such and such a date there was this vacancy. Why didn't you save that job and offer it to me rather than giving it to an external candidate? So I think the general answer is you kind of have to look at um, how, if you put yourself in the at risk employee's shoes, how would they go about proving that you hadn't met your obligation and then doing all you can to counter that? So, I mean, one precaution um, is if you don't have any kind of intranet record where you can show day by day or week by week which vacancies had been opened up and were available, um, you may need to... Uh, be sending emails between HR managers in different countries saying we've got the following um, uh, potentially redundant um, anonymized individuals. These are their skill sets or CVs. Um, these are the roles they currently hold. Do you have anything potentially suitable? And then when you get a reply, no, you keep that on file. If the reply is yes, then obviously there's a further stage of if you're not going to offer that role, you need to try to record, well, the reason we're not offering this job to that individual is because they don't have the language level required or they don't have this or that skill or because in practice experience shows that it would be impossible to get a work permit for that individual in this country, whatever the reason is. But um, as I think I've already mentioned earlier, uh, really a good uh, precaution to keep records at the time of that decision process because it may be a long time afterwards that you then have to do some digging to find out and, and explain as best you can in court why you took that decision. Um, yeah, I hope that yeah, sort of covers it. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so a question here about militant work, <laughs> militant unions, works councils. I think this might be for you, Sophia. Uh, how can we mitigate the risk of unions or works councils starting a conflict with us? Uh, well, uh, well, in Italy it's basically impossible. <laughs> you can't mitigate this risk. Uh, no, I'm joking. Uh, yes, of course. Um, well, I think uh, first point is uh, um, we should think that you 
industrial relations in general, so Works Council unions relations are a local matter. It's something that should be handled locally with uh, having a look at uh, the local practices and uh, how the market answers to some behaviors. So um, my advice in, 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 this, in this case uh, to answer to this question is just trust the local management uh, taking into account that unions may not speak in English, so which is certainly a, a key point. So unions may not be able, may not be able always to speak in another language, uh, mm -hmm. the language of the headquarters. So it may be necessary that um, that you follow the instructions of the local management on dealing with unions in order to take all the suggested steps to avoid criticalities uh, with unions. They may, you know, go to court, they may go to court and file a claim against the company. Another suggestion may be to evaluate with the employers association or um, you know, local advisors, how to better structure both the no formal notification to unions as well um, informal communication to the unions. Just you know to think that the unions are a local matter and before approaching them, uh, knowing how is the best for the company may be always the best in the local market and may not be how we would like to approach them. So just do a step back and trust the local practice. Thank you. Yeah. If you have time for one more question. Um, so so um, Hayden, I think this might be one for you. Um, what is the what are the consequences um, of having a, a weak business rationale for the restructure? Sure, I'm happy to field that one. I think, um, well, I kind of touched on it a bit um, in our discussion by, by talking about how it impacts strategy and timing and, and costs. I think kind of the, the ultimate price to pay is, is you end up with a claim from an employee um, and should it go to its kind of worst case scenario, you have a court that says, um, you know, you didn't, there were no valid grounds to terminate here. Um, and the employee can be entitled to not only financial payments, but in, in some countries reinstatement. And so in that, in that instance, you've gone through this entire process only to be stuck with the the employee on a reinstatement basis um you know i think oftentimes we try if it gets to that point we're trying to mitigate trying to reach an agreement um and settle with the employee so that's not the case but but reinstatement is a is a real um a real risk um in in certain countries and so i think um you know from that business perspective, it is the timing and cost implications and how it can impact what process you take um, and how you, you negotiate up, up front. Um, and on the more kind of broad employee impact stage, um, looking at it from an employee claims perspective. And, and I think part of what the planning and strategy piece goes to is being able to flag early on to say, hey, we, we've got a, a weak rationale here. We need to account for that so we don't end up in our worst case scenario. I mean, it, you know, it's almost impossible to 100% mitigate all risk all the time. But if we can flag it and we know it up front um, and strategize appropriately, we hopefully don't end up in a, a position in that worst case scenario. So kind of reiterates the point of why that, that strategy and analysis in front is so important.
Yeah, absolutely. It really does. It sets the tone of the whole process. If we get that right, everything else tends to flow a lot more smoothly. But um, we appreciate also that it's not always possible to get those uh, rationales as tight as possible. And then we have to look at other ways of mitigating um, the risks, particularly through severance. Um, okay, well, that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, we hope you found it um, useful and informative. Uh, if there are any questions that we haven't been able to address, we will uh, try and follow up with you. Um, but we'd like to all thank you for attending. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.